Welcome to the Seven Secrets of the End Time. So glad that you are here with us tonight. Uh, I am Mark Petrowski. I have the uh, greatest privilege of spending a, a few wonderful evenings with you. I look forward to meeting you, chatting with you, uh, answering your questions. Uh, I want you to know that it is just an absolute delight and an honor for me to be here tonight. And we are honored, especially honored to have you here tonight. I'm glad that you are here. You know, we could have been doing different things. It's springtime, right? Uh, the rain came up here a couple of minutes ago, but you braved it out. And I'm so glad that you're here tonight. I want you to know you're in for an incredible adventure. Uh, I pray that this will be something that will revive you spiritually, will give you a deep understanding of God's Word, but most importantly of all, uh, through this series, we want to just uplift and glorify Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen. And I pray that you will just have a fresh appreciation for His plan of salvation and what He taught about these exciting days in which we live in. So before we begin, I'm going to just invite you where you are to uh, just bow your heads with me and I want to pray before uh, we start. Uh, dear Lord God, our Redeemer, our friend, we want to give you all the honor and all the glory because you're a wonderful God, a good God. Tonight, Lord, we just want to magnify your name and we want to say thank you above all else for Jesus coming down to this earth, becoming one of us, and dying in our stead, in our place. But also, dear Lord, that on that third day, that Sunday morning, we walked out of the grave. And today, we have a wonderful, wonderful high priest interceding on our behalf. I thank you that we can be here together, uh, united by a uh, common fellowship and a, uh, just a, a desire uh, to know you, to know your word, to be affirmed in our faith, uh, walk with you. And Father, I pray that tonight uh, you will just percolate uh, in our hearts uh, and, 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 and revive us anew. I want to say thank you, God, for these beautiful people who have responded in their lives, in their hearts, to your call. We could have been doing so many other things, but Lord, here you are. We, we are here for a reason. And we believe that reason is because of your call and your leading in our life. I pray that tonight I will, uh, as it were, disappear off the stage. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you will be exalted and that you will take charge of this presentation. Thank you that in these last days we do not have need to fear, be scared. We don't need to be shaken. <clears throat> For Lord, we stand on you and your word. And what a privilege it is to do that, especially in these days. And so, Father, now, as we open your word, as we study together, I pray for the outpouring of your Spirit upon us. In Jesus' name, let everybody say, Amen. 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 So glad, once again, that you are with us tonight. And I'm going to explain here in a couple of minutes, uh, uh, after our presentation, how the seminar works. Uh, we're going to be here together for an ex uh, exciting few wonderful presentations going to tell you what, uh, what you will be receiving and what you can expect from this series. But tonight I want to take you immediately into God's Word and I'm going to take you to a very uh, profound, what I consider a very profound and a, a, a deep passage of Scripture that literally, now listen to this, literally pinpoints our day. I tell you, uh, there's so many places in Scripture that tell us that we as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, ought to be so excited about. But I want you to know, this one is profoundly important. I've entitled this presentation, The Forgotten Dream. Because in this dream, you know, we, we, <laughs> we have something amazing that God has in soul. Now, let me say something about dreams. All of us dream, right? Sometimes we dream good things. Sometimes we dream bad things. I don't know about you. Sometimes I get weird dreams. Sometimes it makes me feel like I'm just so glad that I woke up. It was a nightmare. And sometimes I'm sorry that I woke up because it was such a wonderful dream. But uh, all of us, the, doc the doctors tell us, dream about seven to eight times a night, each night. And there was a, there's many profound dreams, even in our secular history. 
Uh, one of them was uh, by one of our former presidents, Abraham Lincoln. I don't know, you, uh, most of you, I, I take it you know this story. He was once speaking to his friend, uh, Ward Hill Hammond, and he told him the following. He says, about 10 days ago, I retired very late. I soon began to dream. He says, there seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. And then he said, then I heard subdued sobs, as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. This is now in his dream. There the silence was broken by pitiful sobbing, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. No living person was in sight, but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. I was puzzled and alarmed. I kept on until I arrived in the East Room. So he was in the White House, where I met a sickening surprise. This is Abraham Lincoln. He said, uh, Before me was a platform for a coffin of someone of state, around it with soldiers acting as gods. And there was a throng of people gazing mournfully <coughs> upon the corpse whose face was covered. And so what was this about? Who uh, was dead in the White House? What had happened? Well, the president, as it turned out, was killed by an assassin. Interestingly, uh, on April 14, 1865, John... Uh, Booth Wilkes, or Wilkes Booth, which one is it? I always get, the, get it wrong. Okay, Wilkes Booth, right? Shot the president, and literally the next day, what happened? 7 o'clock the next morning, on the 15th of April, 1865, he died. He's proclaimed dead. A profound, profound dream. But I want to give you tonight a dream that I want you to know that really surpasses that one. This one is of an incredible importance because in this dream, uh, we are told or foretold, laid out in detail, uh, the history of the world, the history of the nations, all the time from that time when the dream was given, right up until, well, way beyond our time, into eternity. It is found... In Daniel, the second chapter. Daniel, the second chapter. And I'll tell you the story briefly. I want to encourage you to read that story for yourself in the Bible. Again, a, a dream that outlined in detail what would happen. Now listen to this. This is important. What would happen on this earth from that time right through to the time of the end? Beginning with that very, very same kingdom that uh, at the time when the dream occurred. Babylon, let me tell you, was in those days the richest and most powerful nation that basically stood on the face of the earth. At that time, it literally was no other nation rivaled anywhere near its greatness and its splendor as it was. And the Bible tells us in the second year of his reign, this is King Nebuchadnezzar. Now you try and pronounce that name. And try to do it with a mouthful of banana. You'll have some interesting times doing that. Second year of his reign, the Bible tells us. Oops, sorry. Second year of his reign. He woke up, he woke up from the dream, and the Bible tells us he could not remember what he had dreamed. And so what did he do? Pretty much like the rulers of that age, he called, as it were, uh, the people that he expected to explain these dreams. These were the astrologers, the magicians, uh, the people who would write out the astrology column in the paper those days. Let's put it that way. The people, the enchanters, uh, the people who have studied the magic arts. He called them together and he told them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now watch with me. This is important. He says, <clears throat> they, 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 they came to the king, they said, well, tell us the dream, king. I mean, all you need to do, just explain the dream to us, and we'll give you the interpretation. He said, well, here's the thing. Uh, he says, 
uh, tell your servants the dream, we will give you the interpretation. But the king rec recognized at that point something was amiss. See, he had been paying them all uh, a very, very handsome wage. He was really looking after them. And they were there primarily for this reason, that when the king called upon them in such occasions, they would have the answers. Now, normally, uh, if the king told them a matter, they could very quickly attach some kind of interpretation, some kind of words to it, and the king would be satisfied. However, this time, this was a different situation because the king didn't remember the dream. So the king wanted them to tell him the dream, number one, and to interpret the dream for them, number two. And he said to them, if you don't tell me the dream, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, he told them, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me what? Yes. Gifts. Lavish gifts. You're going to have... Uh, great rewards and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. And guess what? This was very clever. Because now they were exposed for who they were. They were really, really in a fix. They were really, really in a very, very tight place. And so they said to the king, well, uh, again, king, just tell us what this dream is and we'll tell you the interpretation. What was the king's reaction? Wow. It was really quite something. He said, you know what? You tell me the dream. Did you hear me the first time? And their response to that was, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such thing of a magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. There is no other who can tell it to the king. And here is the first, the first aspect or the first part of truth that they told you in this whole episode, except the gods, or the God of heaven, whose dwelling is not with the flesh. They realized that this was now uh, something that was way beyond their human ability and their human understanding. And so what does the king do? The king, like pretty much in the Middle East today, this is the ancient times, gave out a very rash order. He says, you know what? All of you, I can see we're just fakes. You've, you, you've, I've been had. I've been deceived by you. All of you are going to be executed. Literally, told me it, it's done. Now, amongst the group that were going to be executed, and with this rash command, was four very special youths. The book of Daniel earlier told us about them. Actually, the book of Daniel is named after one of them. Daniel and his three friends, who had been taken captive from Jerusalem all the way 600 miles across to uh, Babylon. And here they were amongst the same group and were suddenly, rashly going to be put down. And so what happened? Interesting. King, uh, the king had given this command and Daniel inquired, why is this command so, uh, so austere? Why is it so sudden? Why is it so forceful? And then somebody explained to them what had happened. So Daniel appears before the king for a short while and says, King, before you carry out this command, can you just give me a little bit of time? Can you just give me a little bit of time? And he went back and explained to his three friends what the king had done. And they knew that their lives were on the line. And the Bible tells us they, they knelt together and they, 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 they had prayed together and asked God to reveal to them what the matter was. Because although this was such a threatening matter to each and every one, their lives were literally on the stake, they knew that it was only God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, who could ultimately reveal to them uh, what the matter was, and thereby they could explain to the king what the dream was. So that night, as Daniel prayed, and his three friends prayed, he went to bed, and God honored their prayer. 
God is a wonderful God, isn't He? He's a God who answers prayer. He's a God who provides for us uh, at the time that we need Him, at the time or in the circumstance that we know Him. You know, God's timing is never too late, but it's also never too early, right? God is always right on time. And that's what He did with His servant, Daniel. And so what He did was, God revealed, gave Daniel the dream 2,600 years ago that you and I are studying tonight. Why are we studying it? Because not only covers ancient, ancient history, but gives us a view of what would happen into the future in all the way through the ages into our day and beyond our day. Is that relevant to you and to me today? Absolutely. I think that's the reason why we ought to study it this evening. And then notice what Daniel's response was. Daniel 2.23. After God gave him, not only the dream, but the interpretation of the dream. He thanked God. And that's, beloved, as, as Christian friends, we can always, we can really uh, just kind of identify with that. Right? How important it is to say thank you to God. You know, to, to, to thank God, to acknowledge God. And, and to give Him uh, the uh, thanks and gratitude for His providence. And He says, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. And have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. And then he told them. He says, don't execute the wise men of Babylon. Interesting. These pretenders really owed their life and their existence to Daniel, right? He says, don't execute them. Take me to the king, he tells the guardsmen. He says, I will interpret his dream for him. And that's exactly what happened. They told the king, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But, now notice with me, there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Now what are we studying here tonight? We're studying our series on seven very important secrets of the last day. Now, beloved, watch this. In heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in what days? The latter days. The latter days. You know, God in another place, earlier, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 46, verse 9 says, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the what? End from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Not yet done. So here's the kicker. Here's what I want you to get tonight in our opening night. This is very important. We are given here, as it were, a kaleidoscope. And this is, this is truly amazing. I mean, you and I are living in the year 2019. You think about that. Way into the future. We're looking now back about 2,600 years. And now what we're about to be, what you and I are about to learn, what is what took place segment by segment by segment by segment of time, all the time, up to our time, plus, plus, beyond what's going to happen in our time. This is what's so profound about this dream. And it really is something for you and for me to consider tonight. He says, as for you, O king, and now he starts to explain what happened and what God had revealed to him. He says, oh, for you, O king, thoughts came into your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. King Nebuchadnezzar just like all the other dictator rulers of the day, was thinking, what's going to happen ahead of his death? What's going to happen in the succession of thrones? Who's going to be the next ruler? Everybody was trying to obviously position themselves and posture themselves to, to, to remain in, in charge. Are you with me? He was considering that. He says, and uh, to come to pass after this, and then he said, 
excuse me, uh, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. So now God came, he says, not realizing it, this pagan king now received the divine revelation as it were. And he tells him the dream. And this is what he says. You, O king, were watching and beheld a great what? A great image. Notice with me. This is what he beheld now in his dream. He says, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was what? Awesome. So it must have had a, 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 an incredible impression upon this king inside of his dream. And he looked at this image, and it says its form was awesome. And the Bible tells us, as he explained this dream, this image stood upon the earth. And it had a grand and awesome look to it. This image's head, now notice with me, now he goes into the details about this dream. And about this image that he sees in this dream. This image's head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms were of, what's that? Silver. Its belly and thighs of what? Bronze. Its legs of iron. Now notice with me. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So a head of what metal? Gold. Arms and chest made out of what? Silver. The thighs of bronze. The legs are what? Iron. And now the legs go into the feet, which are partly iron and partly clay. So there's a continuation of iron down into the feet. But notice, that's not all that happened. This is very important. There's a crucial detail now in this dream. There's a, there's a shift of focus. Because there's a next thing. You watched Daniel 2.34, while a stone, notice with me, a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image, and by the way, where does it strike it? That's a key detail, please don't forget this. It struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them into what? It broke them into pieces. It shattered the entire image. Now notice with me what happens next. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together. They were what? Right, right. They were crushed together. And became like what? Chaff, Chaff from the summer threshing floors. A good uh, eastern uh, imagery of the farmer right threshing out uh, the harvest of the wheat. He says, like chaff uh, from the summer threshing floors, the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. So what happened? Next thing, a rock came, uh, hurling from space, as it were, and it struck the image where? At the feet. At the feet. And what happened? And the stone struck the image, and then notice what happened there. It became a great one. Mountain. And it filled the what? It became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. In other words, it filled the entire earth, this rock that came down and smashed this image into its feet. Amazing. When the king realized that uh, this was the dream. And, and, and suddenly his memory was jolted. It all came back to him. He recognized immediately that this had a divine source, right? This did not just come from human understanding. But why? Why did God give this pagan king this dream? And what is its relevance? What is its significance? Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, we here in this dream have an incredible timeline that is set out in Scripture that surpasses from that time forward 
right through all the centuries, down, down, into the future, past our time, way into eternity. Now let's go through the interpretation of this ring. Because this is very, very exciting. Now, he gives him what the dream actually means. What it uh, stands for. What is its fulfillment? What is, it, what is its meaning? Well, Daniel 2.38 says, You, you, O king, Babylon, are the head of what? You are the head of gold. In other words, your kingdom, your kingdom, Babylon, is represented by that head of gold. By the way, very quickly here, I don't want to spend too much time, but he, you know, history is fascinating. Uh, a little bit of uh, history channel, if I may tell you here, a little commentary. Babylon was just an amazing, amazing kingdom for its day. Extremely rich. It had one of the, at least one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, as it's known. One historian put it this way, it's situated in the Garden of the East, laid out in a perfect square with a moat or ditch around it, its gates of brass, its hanging gardens, rising terrace above terrace, its two royal palaces there with the whole earth prostrate at her feet. A queen in peerless grandeur stood the city, fifth capital of that kingdom which was represented by the golden head. It was literally just a splendorous kingdom represented by the head of gold. As I alluded to earlier, the hanging gardens of Babylon, may I just tell you, were one of the, what we call, or used to call, the wonders of this, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Indeed, that is what we find in Babylon. Some of the other amazing things about this city, this kingdom uh, city, 60 miles of protected walls around it. Its walls were 90 feet high, 30 feet wide. The Euphrates River ran right through the center. And if anyone thought that they could come and basically assimilate the city or besiege it, they really laughed them off because they had over 20 years food supply. So they felt very, very confident that any, any ancient foe that would come, any ancient army that would come their way would really be uh, thwarted. The attack would be thwarted. Now, my parents live in Berlin, Germany. And I took this picture for you uh, from the Pergamum Museum, where there is a life-size reconstruction of what is called the main uh, ceremonial gate called the Ishtar Gate. It's, it, it's really uh, replicated to the finest detail with some original pieces in it. Amazing, amazing structure to stand in front of. Blue glazed brick. And it had these lions depicted all over the gate. And then uh, there's a model there showing the uh, processional ways when Judah was taken captive and the Israelites were marched 600 miles east and taken into the city. They were marched, Daniel and his three friends and the others, along this route underneath this gate as they were par paraded, as it were, the bounty of, this, of, of, of the nations. But now, you can just imagine as the king was listening, oh, this must have most probably felt, may have felt good. He was the head of gold. But Daniel didn't stop his interpretation. He didn't stop just there. He had something else to tell him. Oh, there was more to the dream. Yes, there was more to the dream. And so we read that later on, Daniel explained further to Nebuchadnezzar. But, Oh, oh, and I can just see how Nebuchadnezzar's face or his smile was probably faded as Daniel uh, uttered the following words. But after you, in other words, he's not going to last forever, <coughs> shall arise another kingdom. Ah, yes, another kingdom is going to come after the Babylonian kingdom. Inferior to yours, a little weaker, as it were. Inferior to yours, not as splendorous as you, the head of God. And may I just say, Nebuchadnezzar's tablet that you can find in the very same, very same museum. I've seen it with my own eyes against the walls. 
in cuneiform, Akkadian language, which was the language of the diplomats back in those days. He wrote, the fortifications of Esgila and Babylon I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. In other words, he wanted to make sure that he and his kingdom and the others will know that he would be standing there forever. And then remember, later on in Daniel, the fourth chapter, just a few chapters forward, it was him who spoke the words. He says, the king spoke, saying, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power, for the honor of my majesty? In other words, on Nebuchadnezzar's mind, what he wanted to establish was that he, only he, and his kingdom would stand forever, and there would not be another one. However, here's the kicker. In one fateful night, Unbeknown to him, with brilliant strategy, uh, king of the Medes and Persians called Cyrus, actually we have the exact date, it was October 13, it was in the fall of the year 539 BC, devised a strategic plan to conquer Babylon. What he did is they diverted the Euphrates River from its flow under the city. When they diverted it, the, the, the river level dropped from underneath the bridge and that gave a passageway to his army to enter that city. And what was remarkable about it, even more remarkable about it, that about 200 years before, it was actually prophesied that that's exactly what would happen. And the actual king was named 200 years before, who would basically capture Babylon? This was amazing. In Isaiah 45 verse 1, Thus says the Lord to His anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before Him, and loose the armor of kings, to open before Him the double doors, so that gates will not be shut. And you remember, in Daniel, uh, we, we read how they were partying with Belshazzar's feast when suddenly that hand appeared on the wall. That was the very, very same night that Cyrus came in and he took control. And without much of a fight, Babylon fell in one night. Suddenly. Just like that. Just like that. And who took over? It was the chest and the arms of silver, or the nation representing them. The arms, the two arms and the chest of, 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 of silver. Uh, Media Persia. And Media Persia, by the way, dominated the then known world for a good amount of time, but they would not dominate forever. As Babylon fell, so eventually Media Persia would fall. And the Bible says next, the third kingdom, one of bronze, even a little bit less inferior. You see, there's a, there's a quality lost here. Will rule over the whole earth. And what happened? Well, for us, living on this side of the time spectrum, it's, it's, it's incredible for us to look at our history books, to look at the history channel, and to basically see how this was fulfilled. It was Alexander the Great who defeated Darius III of Persia in the Battle of Arbala in the year 331 BC, and Alexander took control of the then known world at the age of 31, sweeping the then known world. As one historic historian wrote, I'm persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand, and this is Arian writing, presiding both over his birth and his actions, speaking about Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. And what was interesting, that the uh, corresponding metal was actually pretty dominant in their armor and in their fortitudes. It was bronze. It was brass or bronze. That was the common metal that was used by the Greeks at that time very, very uh, exponentially. History of Rome. 
Then we find something else that happened. Because Alexander the Great with the Greek <coughs> Empire would not last forever. Because on June 22, 168 BC, now we're getting a little bit closer to our day, in the Battle of Pydna, perished the empire of Alexander the Great 144 years after his death. And now we find another kingdom taking over. And what happened after, what, what metal did we find? We found the head of gold, the arms and the chest of silver, the thighs of brass or bronze, and then the legs of what? The legs of iron. Then legs came. Who was that? Ah, very powerful empire that appeared on the world stage. The Roman Empire with the legs of iron uh, from about 168 BC. The Bible says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as what? It will be strong as iron. Strong as iron. Very, very important. It was the Roman Empire, by the way, why they managed to overcome, not only through different the fact that they had a superior way of governing themselves and building and, and, and battling. But their armaments were armaments not of bronze or of brass, but of iron. And so the Greeks uh, basically caved in to the Romans. Now something very interesting, and I must pause here for a moment, because this is an important detail I don't want you to miss. It was during this empire, that our Savior was born. Are you with me? What empire was present at the day that Jesus came into this world as a baby in Bethlehem? It was Rome. Who crucified Jesus? We just had Easter, right? Who was it that crucified Jesus on the cross? It was the Romans, right? Whose spear jagged side and Pulled open as it were the wound on Jesus' side and blood and water came gushing out. It was a Roman spear. It was the Roman Empire that existed in the time that heaven, that God sent down His Son in our state to come to this earth. It was Pilate, remember. It was a trial before Pilate that Jesus received His uh, condemnation. And He uh, gave the authority for uh, Jesus to be crucified, as it were. But now something interesting. Now we're getting a little bit closer and closer and closer to our day. Follow with me. This is important. And that was 41 of Daniel 2. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of what? Now notice with me. This is important. So this will be a, what kind of a kingdom that happens after the Roman Empire? A divided empire. A divided kingdom. Now something that's very important here. Please don't miss this detail below. There's an element of Rome that exists past the time that, that, that it, or as it were, uh, came off the world stage. But there's an element of Rome that remained and would be with us for the time past the Roman Empire. Now notice something interesting about this uh, description of what would happen to the ancient Rome, to the ancient Romans once they passed through uh, the stage of, of world history, or taking, having taken the center stage of world history. The Bible says, so the people will be a what? Beloved, this is very important. Mixture and will not remain, what's that word? Amen. Will not remain united. Any more than what? Iron, Iron mixes with what? Can you imagine, those of you who do metal work, and those of you who do build, if you try and pour in a hot, uh, hot, red hot liquid iron, which is, you know, heated up to several hundred degrees Fahrenheit, right? Pour it in with clay. What will you get? You'll get a funny mixture indeed. Can they mix? They can't mix. Why not? But because they're, they're totally different composite elements, they will not mix into one. 
Now notice with me, this is very, very important. He says, they will not remain mixed. And so now, it's interesting as we now look a little further with history coming closer and closer to us, what happened with the Roman Empire? Well, the Roman Empire was never overcome by another empire, but the Roman Empire differed from the other empires in this, that it fragmented and it broke up, it imploded on itself. Are you with me? It broke up into different other kingdoms within itself. There was a division of the Roman Empire. It divided. Now, follow with me. We're getting closer and closer to our day. The why this is important. Because literally what happened was, this is the very same fabric, very same state of affairs, that would be with, in, in history, right through, pretty much, until the time of the end. Now, some very strange and funny names that I want to share with you. This is a little bit of European history. Uh, stay with me on this one. Uh, if, you, if you look back at some of what happened with the Roman Empire, it kind of divided itself or broke up into about ten different nations. And the Bible says, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw, iron mixed with ceramic clay, as another version puts it, they will mingle with the seed of men. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not, what? Adhere, Adhere to one another. Just as iron does not mix with clay. In other words, they are going to be kind of thrown together. They're going to try and mix them, but it will not remain mixed. It will not what? Remain mixed. It will not adhere one to another. Very, very important. Now, just give you a couple of the uh, uh, nations that the Roman Empire broke up into and some of the modern equivalents. We're getting now closer to our time. The Alemanni became what we know as the Germans. The Burgundians are the Swiss. The Franks are the French. The Lombards are the Italians. The Saxons or Anglo-Saxons, the English, right? The Suevi, the Portuguese. The Visigoths were the Spanish. And three of those nations, by the way, in the Middle Ages, disappeared altogether, never ever having a modern equivalent between the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Now what's interesting? The Bible said, these nations will never ever, mm, they, will, they will mix, but they will not what? They will not Here. adhere to another. They're going to try and mix them together, but they will not remain united one to another. They'll mix the seed. The Bible says it's going to be intermarrying, as it were, to try and, uh, to try and form alliances and family alliances. But they shall not what? Cleave one to another, or cleave together. And by the way, in history, if we look at European history for a quick, that's what exactly happened. Did you know that most of the European wars of a territory, and, and, and there's so many of them that took place, was really just inter-family fighting? Because they were, they were all intermarrying one another. There were different families that were marrying into other royal families, trying to hold that kingdom, as it were, all of these kingdoms, where the Roman Empire had fragmented into these kingdoms, trying to keep them together. But meanwhile, they just could not make it. Could not make it. Now, there's been other very, very interesting characters since that day who have tried to basically bring Europe together under one flag, under one dominant power. Charlemagne was uh, one of the earlier uh, Kaisers or the earlier uh, rulers who was defeated. Charles V was another one. Louis the 14th, Napoleon of Bonaparte, we know about his quest, got very, very far, but he uh, failed. Kaiser Wilhelm, also defeated, and more recently in history, uh, the Nazis, right, who tried to basically storm across all of Europe, and as the countries are falling like dominoes, to Nazi occupation and dominance. So he had, but what happened? Did they succeed? No. They were defeated. 
Can I tell you something interesting? This lecture was actually presented at a, at a very, very astute, uh, special place. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was an article, in a, it wasn't a lecture, it was an article in a magazine called Signs of the Times. At that time, Tally, and this was the day that, this was at the height of Nazi populism, the time that uh, Hitler was just ah, becoming absolutely dominant in that time. And they bravely, knowing this prophecy, <coughs> declared on its front cover, Nazi Germany will never unite Europe. Why? Daniel 2. And this was, by the way, the, 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 this was now several years before uh, the end of the Second World War. At that time, I I'm telling you, humanly, it looked like there was nothing to stop this war machine from just taking over. But they confidently could say that. Why? Because the Bible had declared it. Now, we're getting a little bit closer to our day. Now, follow with me. Because I don't want you to miss this. I don't want to get lost in the details. Even today, in our postmodern time, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even in today's day, there was always this attempt to still kind of keep the, the, the nation of Western Europe what? United. United. Somehow keep them together. I don't know if you've been watching the news at all, if you've been watching what the news have said, but I want you to know this is exciting. The people, by the way, the Bible says that the people will be a mixture, but they will not what? So they're going to get it right to somehow artificially unite them, but they will not what? They will not remain united. So at the time it may look as if it kind of <laughs> works, it kind of comes together. But the Bible warns and the Bible tells us it will not remain that way. Now, can I ask you, who have you have been watching either Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, or any of these other channels and have heard about Brexit. Anyone been listening to Brexit? Have you seen uh, <clears throat> Theresa May struggling in the uh, British Parliament to pass a deal about what? The United Kingdom, at least part of it, part of those original Part of, part of those original nations which, which, which represent the old, you could say, old ancient Roman Empire actually what? Breaking away. Say so we're not going to remain in this. It's actually the, the very same word that you, you can actually hear it in the news. We will not remain. Now, however, they're not the only ones. Because the Switzerland, and by the way, and Norway also did not participate in this union of 27 countries. And so we find even in our 2019 headlines, 2,600 years later, we find still the very same relevance, the very same meaning of what God had revealed to an ancient pagan ruler, back in these days. For me, that is very, very, very exciting indeed. And if we, and if our political leaders could just take the time to read the Bible, and take the time to understand the Bible, perhaps it would be uh, a lot better on our earth. Because we would, they would understand that this was actually something that God had said and ordained back in those days. Why is it? By the way, and I don't want to spend too much time here. Why is it that they're trying to give Britain such a hard time? Because they know if Britain gets it right to break away from the, this union, trying to keep these ancient nations together, what's going to happen with the other ones? They're going to find it much easier to break up as well. And so you find them time and time again fighting against the words that God spoke right there, Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they shall not, what? Cleave one to another. So we find here, back to our dream, 
Daniel explaining to the king all of the successive nations right up until our day. But now as I close, that's not the climax of the dream. This is not the main focus or purpose of the dream. What happened next in the dream? Ah, something happened. And now we need to pay very particular attention because now we're talking about something that's extremely relevant in our day and in the time just, just beyond into our future. That you and I in Calhoun, Georgia can enjoy and appreciate in a brand new way tonight. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Now watch with me. Notice with me what the Bible says. I'm reading again from Daniel 2, verse 44. In the time of those kings. Which kings? The feet of partly clay, partly iron. When they're trying to keep them together, right? Now notice with me what the Bible says. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a what? A kingdom that will what? Never be destroyed. Now what's important here? As I mentioned to you, all of this, if you find that was fascinating, I hope so. That's, in, that's interesting, but this is now really should capture our attention. Because the Bible says in that era, something significant is going to break in on the history of the world that you and I must be ready for. I believe that's the reason why you're here tonight. And that's the reason why we put on this seminar. As we are studying these amazing, amazing truths of God. Notice with me. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms. Bring them to an what? Yeah. Oh, so a new order will come in to the world. There's going to be out with the old. In with a new order. So there's going to be a change. The history of this world as we know it will come to an end. And when will that happen? In which days? In the time of those days. Is it speaking about the head of gold? No. Is it talking about the arms and chest of silver? No. Is it talking about the legs of iron? No. no, it was talking about what? The time of the feet of partly iron, partly clay. It says in those days, God will set up a kingdom. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. In other words, it's not a human political kingdom. This is completely different, different nature. It says a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to what? To pieces. The great God was shown the king that will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is what? Now, beloved, you think about that. If you and I were back in those days, we would say, wow, that's a nice story about what's going to happen in this earth. But now in our day, in 2019, you and I can now look from this side of history and what do we see? Ah, oh, it's true. We can trust Jesus. We can trust His Word. We can trust what God said back then. Absolutely. Completely. Despite even the evidences of what others have never been able to see, what you and I see today. And for me, that is an incredible privilege. So what about this rock? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus, time and time again, is going to come again. How will this world end? With a massive meteorite? With a massive a nuclear explosion that's going to kill everybody, obliterate everyone from the face of the earth? No. The Bible says God's kingdom will bring an end to everybody. And 317 times in the New Testament alone, Jesus said, I will what? I will come again. I will return. Even when you don't see it, when you don't sense it, when, you're, when, you're, when your senses are telling you differently, trust me, I am coming again. 
I am coming and I will come again and put an end to the history of the world as we know it. Revelation 11 verse 15 puts it, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and He shall what? Reign forever and ever. So notice with me the sequence of events here. First of all, this chapter tells us that Jesus' second coming is a fact. It's affirmed. We can fully and absolutely trust God in what He says. We can see how the history, the political history, has been fulfilled before our very eyes. We can see how the Bible tells us that God will set up His own kingdom, put an end to the kingdom of the world as we know it. It will last forever. Jesus will be anointed as the King of Kings, and He comes to this earth to reign forever and ever. And you know, when, when Daniel explained this to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know what he said? This was his response. Truly, your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of kings, and our revealer of what? Secrets. And you and I have the privilege of knowing Him tonight. Tonight, you and I have the privilege of just acquainting ourselves and reacquainting with it. Because right before, in one chapter, you and I can basically see the sweep of history gone before us. But now the focus turns upon our day. See, all of those have passed away. We find the focus now, the Bible, falling upon the rock. Which, by the way, doesn't strike the head, doesn't strike the arms, doesn't strike the legs, but strikes the what? So it was during that time period that we find what happened. Jesus coming to the earth. And Jesus ending, the Bible tells us, with all these angels, Ending history as we know it. Interesting on Calvary. Now we just celebrated Easter. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, remember? He said, then we turned to him in his dying breath. He said, Lord, don't forget me when you come into, this, into your kingdom, right? Remember that? He said to him, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your what? Into your kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is uh, coming again. And Jesus is coming again. And Jesus one day, the Bible tells us in Matthew 25, 34, says, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the what? The kingdom prepared for you. Prepared for you. A beautiful, wonderful kingdom. So as we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, let me explain to you a couple of reasons, just a couple of points how the seminar works. Number one. I want you to know that the Bible will be our main and must be the absolute source of our knowledge. Now, what I mean by that, if you have your own Bible, you're welcome to bring your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we're happy to give you one Bible as well. We do have a number of Bibles we can share with you. We would like for you, the, the emphasis of this seminar is really not what we do here. And here's what, another thing I want you to understand. This is very important for me. When I say things here up front, when I give you some explanation, we're not going to be long together, but when I give you some explanation, you don't have to give me your best concentration. But when we turn to the screen and read, actually, out of the Word of God, then I want you really, really to try hard to understand. And I want you to really, really to, 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 to try hard and put your best effort, to, your best concentration powers to read what God has in store for us. Is that a good thing for us to do? Mm -hmm. So I want you to understand, this is number one. A summary sheet, by the way, will be available each evening to you, and at the door, you will receive some tonight. That will basically outline for you some of the Bible texts we've done yet, or most of them. Now, here's the reason for that. So that you can go home in the privacy of your own home and go over the study that we've done here tonight. Is that fair? Because I don't want you to take just my word for it. I want you for yourself to read and to study God's Word. Are you with me? That's very, very important. Then, remember for the opening weekend, only this weekend, we meet tomorrow. What is tomorrow? Friday, Friday night. That's right. Then we have Saturday night. Only this opening weekend has also a Sunday evening. So we are going to go for this very opening weekend Four nights in a row. Now, did you receive in your packet as you came, there's a whole outline of all the subjects that we're going to cover. Mm -hmm. Have you all received this? Mm -hmm. If you haven't received this, 
I really want you to take uh, a copy with you because that's very, very important. It's right there by the as well. We'll give you the breakdown of the subjects and the titles of these exciting presentations that we, we, we will do uh, in the nights before us. Now, something about our title. This is important. Seven Secrets of the End Times. As we end tonight. The Bible in the book of Genesis introduces us to seven major teachings which has survived throughout the ages. I want you to know that. This is important. There's been a controversy over those teachings throughout the history of the world. Those teachings, particularly the ones that God introduced us to right in the beginning of the Bible, will be at the center of the final crisis before the end of the world. Alright? And Bible prophecy reveals to us the unique issues relating to the end and how we can prepare for those last days. That, in essence, is the seven secrets. You will find that right in the beginning, God gave us some seven very important, and gave us some other teachings too, but seven very important teachings right in the beginning. They've survived right throughout the Bible, always referred to, always taught, but here, at the end of time, we find something happening. And in the last days, these teachings come to the foreground or become the focus of attention as we prepare for the final conflict, for the final crisis in the last days. So tomorrow night, signs you can't ignore. Tomorrow night, we're going to delve very deeply into the Bible. What is going on in the world right now? We study tonight how that throughout history, God ordained exactly what would happen politically. Also what God would ordain, what would be trying to be happened at the time of the end. And we know that in our day, in our era, Jesus is going to come again. Now how do we know? How do we know how near we are? The Bible tells me to give us a date. doesn't give us a time. The Bible says that is God, that is the Father's secret. But... The Bible gives us some very important indicators telling us that it is very what? Near. It's very close. Tomorrow night we're going to be studying that. So, as you leave tonight, please don't forget to pick up the summary of the lesson. Bring a friend. Tonight we gave you, guess what? Five minutes grace. 7.05. Tomorrow night we begin what time? 7.05. 7 o'clock. I hope you can make it. Remember, if you have children or you need childcare, you do provide the wonderful uh, people we have here that are watching our children very nicely for us. We want you to know that we would like to do everything in our power to make this an exciting time for you, a time of uh, revival for you, a time when you will really get to understand God's Word and be able to explain to your friends, to your neighbors, your family about the exciting days in which we live in today. Let me pray with you and then I'll let you go. Father God, we give you all the honor and glory for you are indeed a wonderful God. And tonight it is wonderful to have just perused the journey together through an amazing, amazing spectrum of time. Oh Father, what an awesome privilege. But yes, responsibility for us to have been able to glean through this important information. But more than this being just information, just interesting history. Father, I pray that our hearts will beat a little faster. That we will realize that tonight we are living in the last days. That tonight we will realize that your coming is at the door. As we study in particular what your word has Reveal to us that we should be aware of and be able to take our stand on. I pray that you will be close to my friends, that you will guide them and lead them, bless their families, bless their uh, uh, work colleagues, bless them in their life personally uh, as they journey through this. And I pray that you will reveal your word to them. But above all else, we want to give you all the honor and glory and say thank you for Jesus. And it is in His sweet name, and if for His grace, and if we say, and in His grace, we pray, and everybody say.
Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. God bless you. Uh, see you tomorrow night. Thank you.